Cool. All right, so let's get started. Uh, we have Jonathan and Luca, Luca yep. uh, talking about forecasting with classical and machine learning methods using SK time. Is it SK time? SK time. SK time. All right. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure, pleasure being here and having all of you uh, wonderful people here in the audience. Uh, super psyched to be giving this talk. So yeah, uh, Luca and I, uh, we are contributors and then uh, members of the SK Time organization, which we'll talk about later. Um, but the purpose of this talk, right, is to really kind of go through um, both from just a um, you know educational perspective, uh, how to combine uh, statistical and machine learning methods for forecasting which is, I think, kind of an interesting problem if anyone's familiar with the space. And then also uh, introduce you all to anyone who's not familiar with it, uh, the actual SK time package. And so how it actually makes these workflows uh, a lot more simplified and easier to use. All right, so, all right, so just in case, uh, we're gonna start off with just a couple of definitions here in case people are new to this domain. I imagine quite a few of you probably do forecasting at your job and so maybe you're, you're up to date with the latest research. That's great. But in case uh, we have people who are just getting introduced to this uh, topic for the first time, all right, so forecasting, uh, broadly speaking, is using uh, past observations to predict the future that are sequenced by time, okay? Meaning uh, your data has a particular time index, and then each one of those index points, you have a particular observation. And so you actually wanna use the patterns uh, from previous time-based observations to extrapolate what's going to be happening in the future. Okay, so it is a particular sort of learning task which has unique properties to it, as we'll see in the future. Okay. Um, so generally speaking, uh, the problem statement we're going to talk about here. Okay. Uh, so forecasting is actually a very important component of data science. Uh, lots of companies actually would benefit from from good forecasting, uh, and then it's also an area where machine learning will not necessarily uh, improve your results. Uh, if you're not aware of certain types of details, all right? So um, as we'll see here, uh, getting state-of-the-art and forecasting with ML is actually kind of difficult, and it's actually probably easier to do more harm than good if you're not careful. Uh, it's also true the time series ecosystem in Python, uh, for the most part, is fairly fragmented, okay? Uh, SKLearn doesn't really touch time series models uh, very, very much, actually hardly at all. Um, you know, stats models API is a little rigid, and then uh, just the different components of time series modeling uh, typically kind of exist in sort of like this sort of fragmented ecosystem that's not really unified. And so uh, usually uh, time series modeling in Python is substandard uh, compared to R, particularly if you're, you're sticking with kind of the, the tried and true classical techniques. So uh, we're gonna talk about how SK time, uh, in addition to kind of talking about how to actually do forecasting and some, some best tips and practices, uh, we actually want to learn about how SK time is going to help us reconcile these problems. All right, so we'll go over a few definitions to begin with. Um, then we'll kind of talk about uh, classical and then machine learning methods, uh, their properties and how they compare to one another. We're going to kind of cover like the, the landscape in about two or three minutes there. Uh, we're going to talk about common steps you have to take when doing time series modeling. Uh, so there are sort of definite tasks you have to be able to complete to do it correctly. And we'll walk through some examples to kind of see what that looks like. And then finally, uh, we're gonna work through a few example use cases. So like if you wanna use deep learning, uh, if you wanna have hierarchical data, and you need to you know, uh, forecast a bunch of time series simultaneously, um, these are all very, very common issues you typically have to deal with, and so we're gonna use SK time to demonstrate that. Uh, so hopefully that sounds like a good time, and everyone's looking forward to the next 35 minutes. All right. Okay, so we talked about forecasting. Uh, so time series data, okay. It's probably gonna be best, I think, just to take a look at a picture of it. So we'll go to the next slide here, all right. There are different versions of time series data, but in its simplest form, you can see what it is right over here. So the idea is you have observations recorded at a single time point, like over here. And then uh, usually the index, either explicitly or implicitly, uh, is basically uh, demarcated by a timestamp like this, right? So you have date, observation, date, observation, date, observation, okay? Um, this by itself, you know, this is just a panda series, so it might not really look all that remarkable, uh, but time series data has some remarkable properties to it uh, that you really need to understand if you want to be able to effectively uh, do forecasting. 
Okay, uh, the big thing is uh, time series data has a lot of autocorrelation, which means if you're observing some kind of trend over time, uh, a data point is going to be much more similar to its nearest data points than to ones previously far back in the past, most of the time. Okay, uh, this actually violates a few assumptions of most ML models, which typically assume uh, that your data is, a particular sample is basically effectively random, and it's not really connected to other samples in your data set. So we're going to visualize this uh, to kind of make sure we can kind of uh, get some intuition for how this works. So this is a fairly generic looking time series. I think it represents shampoo sales month by month, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, uh, like a lot of time series, you can see here there's a trend, right? It's kind of going up over time. Uh, it's a little bit random and stochastic, stochastic, if you will. You know, they kind of bounce around a little bit. Uh, but if you look over here at this data point, right? Uh, this data point is more closely associated with its nearest data points over here than with the ones that you see over here. They're closer together, right? So that's basically what autocorrelation is. And so if you wanted to sort of graphically uh, visualize uh, how these values are related to one another, uh, let's take a look at an autocorrelation plot, okay? Uh, if there are any statisticians in the audience, I will point out you would normally difference the time series before we look at this, this plot right over here, I understand that, but this is just for explanation purposes to, to kind of communicate a few points. Okay, so what we're seeing here, right? Uh, every single value in the time series correlates with itself perfectly, okay? But if you look at this, these next points right over here, uh, we can see these values that are around 0.7 or 0.75. Uh, the way you can interpret that, right, is if you look at this point, right, and you compare it to this one, or if you look at this point compared to this one, or this point compared to the one right before it, that usually means there's a 70% correlation that an observation has with this previous value, okay? Uh, meaning, any particular value is not all that independent. And so if you actually look over these different lags, Okay, you can see here uh, the correlation just kind of gradually decays over time and then eventually goes negative. All right, but the take on point here is in time series data, uh, one particular observation is usually closely associated with observations that come before it. So if you actually have a sample from your data set, it's not like you're just kind of drawing a random card from a deck. This next plot, if you shuffle the same time series, okay, and then redo the same plot, uh, you'll see something like this. And you can see here, uh, the correlations in the data then uh, basically go down drastically. So the take home point, right, is that time series data has a very particular temporal structure to it. And so that has important implications for how you can go ahead and model it. Right, and so normally, uh, most ML learning methods are built on this assumption that your data is IID. Uh, which stands for, you know, uh, independently and identically distributed, uh, but time series data is not IID. And so in order to deal uh, with the properties of time series data, uh, there are a number of classical techniques that have been around for a long time that deal with the sequential nature of time data very explicitly. So a few of these are exponential smoothing, ARIMA, and theta. If you're familiar with the time series literature, there's a few others as well. But broadly speaking, they all exist uh, specifically to handle the sequential structure of time-based data. And again, this is something that machine learning models out of the box don't necessarily do. Okay, so for most of the history of time series modeling, uh, the classical models have been uh, fairly standard. And then even today, uh, in a lot of problems, machine learning models will actually underperform classical models. Okay, and so the basic reason why uh, is because autocorrelation, if you have that in your data, uh, basically reduces the effect of sample size of the actual samples you can go ahead and learn from. So roughly speaking, the more autocorrelated your data is, um, the, less, the less important, more distant data points actually are. And of course, your machine learning and deep learning models benefit from lots of training data, right? Uh, but the meaningful training data in your actual data set is going to go down the more autocorrelation that you have. So therefore, it's kind of hard to really reap the benefits of uh, you know, more contemporary machine learning methods uh, if you're dealing with time series data. That's kind of the, the underlying theory behind it. 
And if you want an example of this, there's something called the Monash Forecasting Repository. Uh, it is kind of something similar to maybe like the ImageNet for, for time series models and forecasting. It's a collection of a few dozen different data sets. And so what they do is they have uh, an ongoing update uh, for different data sets and different models, and then their current uh, state of the art. And so if you look through this, you can see on the left-hand side, you have very, very old school time series techniques. And as you go across the right-hand side over here, you get to more and more modern and contemporary architectures. Okay, uh, the highlights are in black, uh, but one of the take-home points should be, um, you know, uh, classical models on a lot of data sets uh, actually still outperform uh, the latest deep learning models. Uh, so kind of the, the take-home point is that machine learning is not necessarily a free lunch when it comes to time series forecasting. And so performance on a particular data set is gonna be very, very contextual. So in some ways, it's almost like the exact opposite of NLP, right? Where like, for if you have a translation problem, you would just kind of automatically do some kind of transform or not really think twice about it. Um, but that's not true at all uh, for, for time series problems. Um, clarification, when you say yeah. performance, do you mean the speed in which it runs, or do you mean the accuracy? Forecasting accuracy. Forecasting yeah, accuracy. Yeah, forecasting accuracy, yeah. In fact, uh, I'm pretty sure this Actually, I forget exactly what this metric is, but I think it's something like root mean squared error or something like that, or mean absolute error. Um, it's also true, uh, you know, the deep learning models typically take longer to, to fit to, obviously, because they have more parameters. I think it probably goes without saying, you know, but this is just, this is just accuracy. Uh, other questions? Okay, so yeah, yeah, moving on, right? So, um, uh, so time series is a bit different from a lot of other domains uh, in, in data science. Um, but at the same time, uh, there is still a very strong push uh, to actually see if we can actually use machine learning uh, to better model time series data. Okay, so I think there are four big reasons why. Okay, uh, you know, lots of time-based data does have very subtle idiosyncratic nonlinear patterns, and so obviously, you know, uh, a high-parameter machine learning model is going to do a better job of picking up on that. Uh, a lot of times, if you actually want to model time series data. You don't just want to look at previous values, but you want to incorporate external information as well, right? So if you work in marketing, uh, you know you might have like sales or promotions. You know there could be holidays. Uh, so there are a lot of kind of external company-based factors that you might actually want to use when you're you're building forecasts. And then uh, machine learning models are probably going to be better to incorporate the information inside of that than just a pure time series model. A uh, big thing too, right, is uh, lots of time series data sets uh, today you're not just modeling a single time series, but rather you know, thousands or tens of thousands or even millions uh, kind of simultaneously at the same time. And so having like a, a, a time series model for each one of those time series is probably not very practical. So having a, a master time series model that you can use to kind of model all the time series inside your organization is uh, very, very appealing. And then it's also been true in the most recent forecasting competitions uh, the machine learning methods are, keep pulling away from the pack. And so uh, we're continually getting uh, better and better improvements at the very, very top of the domain uh, using different combinations of machine learning methods as opposed to time series methods. Okay, uh, quick show of hands. Has anybody heard of the M4 or M5 competitions? A couple of hands here. Okay, all right, so I know that a few of us are familiar with them. Uh, so these are competitions that are held every couple years. Um, they're used to determine basically current benchmarks for state of the arts and uh, the forecasting domain. Uh, they typically come with cash prizes. They're usually done over Kaggle. Uh, I think like the last one, I think there was $100,000 given out to the top you know, performance performers. And again, uh, people use, like to use the M competitions as kind of a way to understand and discover kind of what current best practices are and uh, you know, what sorts of expectations you can have for time series problems. Most recent one uh, was a bunch of retail data from Walmart, had over 42,000 time series. There were over you know, 5,000 competitors. And so basically, if you looked at the top 50 or top 100 uh, entrants, they were almost all using some combination of machine learning models, sometimes mixed with time series models, but it was clear uh, ML models were actually the best performing. Uh, if you actually looked at the top contestants, uh, the clear winner in terms of method that gives you the best results, probably not too surprising, uh, was like PBM. 
I mean, anyone who follows Kaggle, I mean, lots of G, like Kagglers use, you know, like GBM. But the point is, um, even for, for a time series problem, uh, if you actually have the correct approach, a machine learning model typically can give you better results. All right, so we're gonna talk a little more about the, this last M5 competition, just to kind of give us a feel for what sort of the current precedent is, you know, for, um, for best results. Right, so uh, LightGBM was the most common, uh, you know, technique used. Over 5,000 different teams. Uh, we're pointing out though, so this, the benchmark that the competition used was called ESBU. So what this is, is a technique that will algorithmically determine uh, what sort of exponential smoothing model to use, and then use an exponential smoothing model for each individual time series. So essentially there was sort of this, this classical time series benchmark. And then out of the you know, 5,000, over 5,000 teams, uh, only 7.5% of them were actually able to beat the time series benchmark. So it's kind of the case where machine learning uh, can clearly give you state of the art, uh, but it's not necessarily going to be um, this really straightforward affair to beat you know, a, a, a decently fitted uh, time series model that's you know, well suited to the problem. Uh, something that was actually kind of fascinating is uh, over half the contestants couldn't actually beat the naive baseline, which means if your model is just predicting the last value, you know, you calculate the root mean squared error, about half the submissions actually couldn't be that as well. So just to kind of reinforce the point, right? Um, so if you're dealing with time series problems, uh, you definitely have this issue where the best performing model is not gonna be clear at all beforehand. Okay. Also in terms of how well these, uh, you know, these uh, contestants actually did, so according to the ESBU benchmark, okay, the top 50 contestants uh, all beat it by at least 14%. The number one contestant beat it by 22.4%. To give that a little bit of context, uh, in the M4 competition, no one beat the benchmark by more than 10%. Okay, so meaning um, there is kind of some separation now between the use of machine learning and the use of time series models when it comes to getting state of the art. Now it's also true though, if you compare um, you know, this number right over here with kind of a traditional time series model, I still think in the big scheme of things, it's actually not that large. Like, so for example, imagine if you're looking at a translation problem and you compare naive Bayes you know, to a transformer, I think the difference would be so big, right? You couldn't, it wouldn't even be worth comparing. So the fact that like, we're still in the same neighborhood here, I think does also kind of um, you know, drive some of the point that uh, classical models and machine learning models are pretty tightly coupled together compared to other domains. All right, so if you wanna compare these, okay, uh, so time series models uh, typically have pretty tight distributional assumptions, uh, machine learning models, not so much. Most time series models have a small number of parameters, okay, meaning uh, there'll be a couple of parameters for some of the previous lags. There might be something for, for a seasonal term or trend, uh, but rarely do you have more than like a half dozen parameters for, for a time series model. Obviously, uh, big machine learning models are you know, the exact opposite of that. Uh, time series models are typically fit on an individual time series, whereas machine learning models are usually fit globally on an entire data set, which it turns out is one of the important benefits of using ML for, for lots of large scale time series problems. Okay, and finally, um, time series models are good at just kind of working out of the box on your data. Usually for machine learning models, you're typically gonna to have to do quite a bit of feature engineering uh, in order to get desired results. Okay, so we're gonna spend uh, the rest of this presentation actually kind of walking through a few example workflows and seeing how SK time kind of gives you a nice unified toolbox for combining these different methods and then chaining all the intermediate steps together. Okay. So like I mentioned before, right, uh, one of the current problems, if you want to use time series models in Python, the ecosystem is fairly fragmented and inhomogeneous. And so it can be difficult uh, combining all the different tools together. Uh, so SK time provides a unified interface uh, to basically unite uh, the time series ecosystem in Python. So these are just some examples, stats models, profit, TS learn, PMD arena, uh, all of these are actually incorporated into SK time, and then you can go ahead and use them for a variety of time series problems. So it's basically designed to be the only time series toolbox you'd have to use in Python, 
even if there are these great new tools coming out elsewhere, uh, SK Time has a really strong interface to go ahead and just incorporate them into an SK Time compatible estimator. So that way you can basically keep your same source code. All right, so let's take a look and just walk through a few simple examples. All right, so we're going to look at our toy data sets. It's just a time series with some shampoo sales in it. All right, so you can see this right over here. Okay. Um, this is the in-sample data over here, the out-of-sample data you can see over here on the right. Okay, um, so I'm assuming a lot of people here are familiar with the, the scikit-learn interface. You import the model, you fit it, you know, and then you can go ahead and predict it afterwards. Um, so SK Time is designed to basically take that same interface and then apply it to time series, and then you can actually use any sort of time series model inside that interface, regardless of where it comes from. So in our next example here, okay, what we're doing is we're importing an auto arima model. This is a very old school time series technique. Okay, you can see here, hopefully these steps will look relatively familiar to you, right? You're initializing it over here. Um, we're defining here this variable as a forecast horizon, which means we want to use this model to predict six time steps into the future. Okay, that's a common issue you deal with forecasting. A lot of times you might have to make a forecast, you know, for the next two weeks, the next one month, next one year, whatever. And so uh, a lot of times you want to be able to define how far into the future you want to be able to go ahead and predict. So we're saying this, this means just predict uh, six, you know, six time steps into the future, uh, and then you fit, and then you predict over here, and then when you're done, right, uh, these are the model predictions that you have over here, as you can see, all right? Um, the idea is this kind of workflow should look pretty familiar, right? Because I'm sure most of us have used SK Learn at some point or another. So the idea is with uh, SK Time, this line that you see over here, we have auto arima, uh, can basically be any sort of model that you might want to go ahead and use. Okay, so they're classical time series models. You can use any SK Learn estimator, and as Luca's going to talk about now. There are also interfaces now for PyTorch transformers as well. So if you're actually using the, the latest in deep learning, uh, you can basically incorporate any of that and use it in the same homogenous workflow. All right, um, if you're curious or if you doubt, you know, kind of like the, the footprint of SK time, uh, it has a few different uh, functions you can use to look up available estimators. And so if you can see here, uh, currently, um, there are over 70 different time series models that are directly built in uh, to SK time. And it's also true, uh, you can just, it's compatible with any sort of SK learn like interface. So um, even if it's not listed here explicitly, you can still use it. Okay, um, so we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about now specifically how to use machine learning for forecasting problems, right? We talked about before. Uh, out of the box does not necessarily give you good results. Uh, it can actually be quite difficult to beat a good time series benchmark, but it's also true at the same time. If you do want the best results, most of the time you're gonna have to use machine learning models to go ahead and get that. So the way uh, SK Learn handles this is with something called a reduction, uh, which is essentially uh, you know, being able to transform one sort of problem into another. So in the case of uh, reduction for, for forecasting, Right, so this is time series data over here on the left, right? Uh, a machine learning model isn't necessarily gonna have recognition of these previously occurring values. So what you actually have to do is reconstruct your data so that way it looks like this, right? So the previous values exist as their own independent columns, and you use this as input to basically go ahead and predict what Y is, all right? So this is kind of the reduction that's happening with SK time. And you can set this up uh, with a single function call. So let's take a look. All right, so what we're going to do here, we're using uh, you know, SK Learn's version of LightGPM, the Hiss Gradient Boosting Regressor. Uh, same thing, um, any estimator that has an SK Learn interface. So it doesn't really matter where it comes from. Uh, you can initialize it the same way. And the way you can plug this into a forecasting problem uh, is with the function make reduction. All right, so this is the argument right over here. And then this right over here, window length, where it's set equal to 16, refers to how many of these columns you're adding over here for previous values. 
So it is, you can easily specify um, you know, how, many, how many lag values you want to use in the forecasting problem. And you can actually mix and match this with any sort of you know, estimator that you're already used to using. So if you go ahead and do this, okay, uh, same thing, you can fit and predict. Uh, take a look, these are the out-of-box results. Um, just using the eyeball test, you ought to be able to see the predictions are not very good. Like, they're not really obviously incorporating, right, the trend inside the data. And so same thing, that's because, um, you know, uh, machine learning models aren't really well designed to handle time series data out of the box. So this is kind of a common example. So if you have a trend, a uh, common issue with like a tree-based model is that um, trees can really only extrapolate to values that they've seen inside the training set. Right, so that means if you have a trend, your out of sample data is probably going to be larger than anything a tree-based model would see. So therefore, it's not really going to be able to go ahead and extrapolate, you know, to like some, if you're trying to predict, you know, 100 samples into the future and you have a trend in your data, 100 time points out is going to be larger than anything you see in your training data. So therefore, you're not going to have great results. Okay, and you can see here, right, out of the box, the ARIMA model works better than the history boosting regressor. Um, but the way you fix this, right, is with some kind of transformation step. So I think most of us are used to pipelines in our models. So uh, SK time includes a variety of convenient time series transformations that are usually necessary for pre-processing. Okay, so in this case what we're doing is we're gonna difference the data, right, which is where you actually just subtract one value from the previous one. Uh, this is the way of detrending it. And so now if you look now, uh, there's no obvious trend inside the data, which is really helpful because that way if you're trying to predict into the future, the range of values in your out-of-sample data is going to map to what you have on the in-sample data. And so if you set up a pipeline, which you can do with this one step right over here, right? So the forecaster, and you can just go ahead and then take the transformation step and multiply and redo the same thing. The results are not necessarily great, but they're at least coherent meaning the predicted values are kind of aligned with the actual level of the out of sample values over here. All right, so that's a common transformation step that you have to take. And then also it's SK time gives you a very nice unified interface for incorporating these into your modeling steps. Uh, same thing, right? So SK learn does not have great pre-processing for time series models, uh, but this is really easily built into the SK time interface. All right, uh, we're not gonna go over them now, but things like accounting for seasonality, uh, things accounting for trend, um, are all built into the SK time interface, and so adding them to your modeling pipeline is very simple and straightforward. And it can also definitely improve your results. Okay, so here's another example. I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time, but the idea is, right, uh, you can difference, de-season lines, or do anything else, attach that to your, your estimator at the end, and you can get useful results out of the box pretty quickly. Okay, uh, next thing we're talking about is global forecasting. Okay, so this would be a bunch of time series models all at the same time. Very common real world scenario, right? Uh, so in time series models, they're not always good at dealing with this because you have to fit a model individually for each time series. Uh, this is a little bit inconvenient, and it's also the case that if you have a global time series, most of the time, uh, the time series are going to be interrelated. So here's an example, a global time series that's hierarchical in nature, so you have your product line and the product group and different you know, time series inside those. Uh, the idea is most of the time, uh, time series in the same product group might share similarities, so it makes sense to learn from their joint patterns. And so you don't get that with just regular time series modeling. So this is one of the benefits of using machine learning models because you actually have bigger effective sample sizes, so therefore the enhanced pattern recognition of ML begins to go ahead and kick in. All right, let's get this real quick just in the interest of time, All right? So this is kind of the difference between local and global forecasting, right? Uh, fitting an individual model for each time series versus fitting a single model for the entire thing. And so if you look at this with SK time, let's take a look at some code. Uh, you can also do this easily as well. So the make reduction function we're looking at, right, you pass in the regressor. Uh, you can also specify local pooling or global pooling. And this basically means, do you want to fit an individual model for each time series, or do you actually want to fit every single time series as a global model itself? Um, and again, for ML model, this is typically beneficial, and as you can see here, if you do this, 
Um, the results or accuracy for the global model improved significantly over the local one, but we still actually have not beat the, uh, you know, the time series baseline, again, which is common. So the next thing you typically want to do, right, is actually build out different features, right, that basically capture different properties of a time series. So same thing, this is typically very tedious, takes lots of time, um, but SK Time has good uh, sort of tooling to do this for you automatically. So here what we're gonna do is calculate window features. So this is basically, you know, you take maybe, you know, the mean or the average of standard deviation over the previous n samples. And so here you can specify, right, uh, what sort of statistical uh, measure you wanna use, the size of your window, and just with a typical transformation step, you can call fit transform, and you can basically turn your time series data into something like this, all right? Where in addition to having the previous lag values, you also have these window statistics for each of the individual time series. And then the benefit of this is there can be a lot of unique patterns in these features that a typical time series model wouldn't see. So this is the skewness of the individual time series. Right, you might look over here and see this, right? This is very unusual. There's a large structural break for this time series. Uh, without this kind of feature processing, you wouldn't necessarily be able to capture this. And this is the exact sort of thing a machine learning model could potentially see very well. All right, so same thing. If we rerun through the same steps, okay, we can now see uh, the same model with global pooling and the window transformation that it in is now about 10% better than the auto rerun. All right, this is a simplified example, but that's kind of the idea behind the framework, is you can mix and match different methods and processing steps and give yourself a coherent uh, time series workflow. Um, so with that being said, right, uh, deep models, deep learning models are all the rage. So I'm going to hand it off to Luca here uh, to finish it off to kind of talk about how you can incorporate uh, PyTorch into SK Time. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi everyone, I'm Luca. I'm a contributor at SK Time, and I've been working on taking some PyTorch networks and providing interfaces uh, with the SK Time library. So here's an example of one of the models that is available to use. As you can see, it follows the SK Time conventions, uh, SK Learn conventions, to have, uh, define the model, fit the model, predict the model. So yeah, it's easy as that, you know, we plot the predictions right here. This time series specifically was multivariate, and what's cool about this forecaster is that it actually fitted a specific layer for each time series, and you can see the out of sample predictions on the right side here. So how does one actually uh, choose the right model to use uh, for their use case? A couple pointers. Uh, first, you'd want to start with a very simple model, uh, something like the, uh, either a naive forecaster or uh, one of the classical models that Jonathan was talking about. And then you can start to add more complexity. Uh, ML models and deep learning models can be added. And then throughout that process, you'll want to get the accuracy of each model to know if the complexity you're adding is actually helping or not. Now in this chart right here, the models at the top are going to be simpler and then they're going to uh, go down as they get more complex. And just to reference the M5 competition that Jonathan was talking about, the, um, the benchmark was actually a classical model, so it's only this row two in this table right here. So everything beyond that is going to have a greater complexity. Right, and then uh, Jonathan also had an example where he composed a pipeline. Um, so kind of building off that last point, you can mix and match these models to build a, a transformer that can get uh, high accuracies. All right, and building off that last point again, when you have a long pipeline, it can, uh, it can be helpful to do ablation testing, which means you take away certain parts of the pipeline you reevaluate and you say, well, if the performance stayed the same without this uh, feature, then clearly it wasn't important, I can get rid of it. So that's a good way to figure out what's actually working and not in your pipeline. Okay, so just kind of to summarize, uh, Jonathan talked about uh, time series forecasting, the basics, some classical models, and we also talked about the interaction between these classical models and the newer ML models, when they're useful, when they're not. 
We also talked about uh, how you can go ahead and implement some of these models. So as kind of a final point, uh, SK Time itself is supposed to be a very open, inclusive community. Whoever wants to contribute can, and we'll make it really easy. All you have to do is join the Discord, and we actually have weekly meetings every Friday where if you want, you can, uh, you can show up, talk to any of the devs, um, get some one-on-one uh, -on -one help with whatever uh, project that you're working on. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Um, what's dependency management like for installing this? Um, well, so the documentation is on the website. You just use like a pip install SK time, and uh, there's some other dependencies. There's like, you know, it, it's a unified package that so we pull in different things. So um, there's something called all extras. You can uh, install more things if it's not working. So you could, so if I was only interested in say like the stats models back end, you have that as like an optional dependency, or they won't break me out that way? Yeah, yeah, so oh, okay. yeah, cool. it, it, it wouldn't break if you didn't have like, you know, Torch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, right, yeah. 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 Let's say out of that, so there are hard dependencies like NumPy, Grandas, right. sklearn, and then for the, the zoo of other stuff that you have, you might actually want to use, those are soft dependencies, and then you can install those specifically as you need them, not as just not one gigantic package. Uh, thank you for the talk. This is quite amazing. Um, does SK Time currently provide uh, conformal prediction tools? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Conformal prediction is built into it. And then for anyone else who doesn't actually know about that, conformal prediction is a uh, statistical method okay. that actually gives you a statistical guarantee for probability estimates. And so historically, you know. Um, Probabilistic forecasting was easily more easily used with uh, classical time series models, uh, but with conformal prediction, you can basically combine probabilistic forecasting with machine learning models to not just get better point estimates, but to get better confidence intervals as well. And that's just kind of context for the entire audience. But yeah, it's actually built into SK Time. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, so here we assume that the time series is like explains itself because we do all the window operations, like seasonality operations. But can we have also like uh, other drivers of the time series, for example, marketing expenses, and have uh, like doing multi-time series forecasting with this framework? Yeah, so um, we, it wasn't actually due to time constraints, it wasn't covered in the examples here. But basically, uh, we basically only fit the models on Y and just kind of extrapolated from that. But uh, for any sort of uh, forecaster, uh, and then for any kind of time series, uh, SK time compatible data set, you can also pass in a corresponding X as well with independent predictors. And then it would actually just look at that automatically and build it into the predictions of that model. Any final question? Are we sharing the slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, um, afterwards, they should be able to be disseminated. If they're not there, I'll, I can double check and then. Uh, I can look after that. We'll definitely show the slides. Okay. I have a question. Uh, where, where does um, uh, PyTorch fit in? Like, have you uh, like uh, have you included something in SK Time that, that uses PyTorch, like an LSTM model or some you know, network-based model? Uh, we, don't have, we don't have LSTM yet. Uh, we're looking to expand to you know some more uh, state-of-the-art models like that. But we just have a like like PyTorch backend, so the user doesn't actually have to like really interact with the tensors. All right, let's thank our speaker.